Really quick, I want to take us to Matthew chapter 13 today for just a few moments of time and share with you a continuation of what I believe God has for us today. We learned last week, kids, that the kingdom of God is not a literal, tangible place on this earth. In other words, if we all moved to Nauvoo, you wouldn't mean you were in the kingdom of God. It would mean you were in another place, Missouri. If we were to move to Disneyland, uh, some people would say, oh, this is like heaven on earth. But the truth is, guess what? Disneyland is not heaven. Matter of fact, it's, it's becoming quite a challenge. And uh, if, if, if your idea of heaven is some amusement park, all you have to do is stand in line long enough and you'll realize you ain't in heaven. <laughs> all you have to do is open your eyes to what's around you and you'll realize very quickly that, you know what, as much as we put entertainment on a pedestal and an altar, the truth is that is not heaven. That is not heaven. As a matter of fact, it is very important for us, and I, I believe this is very important for us to hear in a, in a congregation where we do have the senior citizens, and we do have the infants, and we do have individuals on every scale in between, because until you die, you will always be challenged with the reality of the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of heaven. Jesus came to demonstrate what it meant to be the kingdom of heaven on earth. And it is important for us to realize that there is a battle going on, but that we have already found victory in Jesus Christ. Amen? And if we have found victory out of the kingdom of darkness, then we ought to be living in the kingdom of light. The letter of Peter was declaring that God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Which means that once you've been delivered from the kingdom of darkness, we don't go playing back there from time to time because we know it's not worth it. As some of you in this room, you've got the testimony, you've got the scars, you've got the battle marks, the wounds to demonstrate the fact that you don't want to go back there. You don't want your kids to go back there. And yet, in this day we live in, they are constantly trying to figure out how to market things that ultimately you were delivered from in order to trap the next generation so they too will have to wrestle through some of the same things. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, as a parent personally, and as have visiting with some of you, the last thing you want for your children is to go through what you went through. You would do everything you could to try to help them avoid that. And listen, that's exactly what Jesus came to do. God so loved the world, everybody in it. He said, listen, there's a better way to live. And according to John chapter 1, he robed himself in flesh and he walked among us in order to display what it meant to live in this world but not be of the world. He walked among us in order to display how that we could live in this world, enjoy this life, enjoy all that there is to enjoy without losing our hope of eternal life. And unfortunately, every generation has to come to that same conclusion. I wish it would have been enough if Abraham would have done what he did and we didn't have to do anything. That's the lazy side of me. I wish it had been enough if David would have gone through what he did or, or, or Peter and Paul would have gone through what they did and we could just kind of ride on their coattails, right? But that's not the way it is. Every generation has to come to a point where they have to acknowledge the fact that there is a battle going on for their soul and for the majority of us, it came to a point where we realized, I've either got to choose Jesus, or I'm going to live for myself. And once you have embraced the King of kings and the Lord of lords, it is incumbent upon us to make the rest of our lives demonstrate that. In this room, yesterday, a memorial service was given for a lady who lived her life in such a way 
that when it was all said and done, her children and her grandchildren were able to declare she knew Jesus. It wasn't because of how she died. It was because of how she chose to live. And today, a couple of short verses as Jesus tries to share with the crowd at that day and with us thousands of years later. Consider this in chapter 13 of Matthew, verses 44 and 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy, Over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Verse 45 and 46, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Both of these short stories demonstrate several things that I hope you can grasp today. Because every one of us in this room knows what it means to find something that is so valuable to us. So valuable that we would be willing to give up our favorite video game. So valuable that we would be willing to give up time with our friends just to do this. It's the typical love story, right? Guy meets girl, and all of a sudden, the guy stops hanging out with his guy friends. Why? Because he's found something that at this time in his life is more important than the friends he used to have. The girl finds a guy, and all of a sudden, she doesn't have time for mom and dad. She doesn't have time to do her chores. She doesn't have time to make her bed. She doesn't have time to do these things that she was doing so faithfully. All because she found something that was more important than making the bed. Some of you teenagers need to hear this. No amens from moms. (laughs) No go preach it from dads. I'm serious. This really happens. It's probably happened to your parents. It's probably happened to each one of us when we go through life and we've got a good thing going and then all of a sudden we find something and say, you know what, I'm going to give up what I had in order to embrace what I don't have. And that's what Jesus was trying to demonstrate in these two parables. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a person who finds a treasure. And when they find this treasure, in verse 44... They don't just say, oh, this is nice. The person who finds the treasure says, this is so valuable, I am going to do whatever I can to make sure I get a hold of this. You notice this line, and for joy over it, over the treasure. In other words, he understands the value of it. He understands the the, the preciousness and the classicness and all the things that make this unique from everything else. He gets it. And because he's finally found it, he says, this is worth more than anything I have had. And so what does he do? He, He doesn't try to add the treasure to his wardrobe. He doesn't try to add the treasure to his bank account. He doesn't try to add the treasure to his safe. He says, I'm going to get rid of everything else. When you get rid of everything else, you eliminate the competition. When you get rid of everything else in order to have this one, you get rid of the distractions. And you begin to commit your life to making sure that you have That which you treasure. Notice, if you will, that the man found what he loved and what he valued and what he was willing to have for the rest of his life. 
Because not only when you sell everything, when you get rid of everything else, are you eliminating the competition. But when you sell everything you had, you have just eliminated the possibilities of going back to that. And some of us have had this experience where somebody has sold us something and then they want it back. You ever had that? Some of you know buyer's remorse. You bought something like, oh, I didn't really want this. But when you want something so much that you are willing to sell everything you had, you're basically saying, I'm not going back. This is what's going to make up the kingdom of heaven on earth and in heaven. There is nobody that goes to heaven that is going to make it through to those golden streets and say, when's this ride over? The people who end up hearing, well done, thou good and faithful servant, aren't going to spend the first 10 minutes in eternity and all of a sudden go, what's next? When we finally see Jesus face to face and we hear those words, well done, there will be no more regret ever. I don't know if you can comprehend that. And I'm glad the kids are here today because our modern day world has so conditioned people that you can't pay attention longer than 15 minutes without a commercial. Now some of you in this room are saying, well, that's, well, that's not me. You're becoming the exception. Things aren't the way they used to be. Preachers used to preach, some of you know this, For an hour and a half. Oh, those were the days. Just kidding. (laughs) No, I'm serious. When I was growing up and you went to church and you were you were younger, mama packed your pillow. Can you get an amen? I'm not the only one here in this room. You packed the crayons, you packed the book, you packed a snack. You were going to the house of God, and if the Lord moved, you didn't know when you were going to be done. Thank you. Some of you you got it. Some of you are like, really? But the truth is, think, think about this. No more time. When we get to heaven, there will be no more time. It's eternity. In heaven. It won't be this mentality that we go to bed so we can get up, so we can work, so we can go back to bed, so then we can get up, we can work. I, I mean, we were at a Bible study just recently, and somebody says, you know, I am so loving my rest. And I love to take those afternoon nights, this was the afternoon naps. And this was a senior citizen. He retired. He worked hard. And he was like in this point of life where he could get up whenever he wanted. He could go to bed whenever he wanted. And if he wanted to take a nap at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, he did it. He says, you know, I, I want to go to heaven. But no naps. I want you to think about that. You're you're not going to get to heaven and say, can I get back to what I was doing? Why? Because you've sold everything you have. You don't want the competition of the things of this world. And you don't want to let there be any idea that somehow I'm just going to enjoy this for a little bit. And when it gets uncomfortable, I got an ace in the hole. No. No. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. And whatever the agenda is for eternity, nobody who makes it in or hears, well done, thou good and faithful servant, is going to ever regret eternity for whatever God has in store. We need to hear this. Because if you think that you're going to go to heaven... And play golf for 18 holes and then go on to the next thing. Surprise! 
It's not in the book. If you think that you're going to go to heaven and play this video game and then go to this video game and heaven for you is an arcade with all kinds of things and me, 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 me. Let me help you right now. That is not heaven. Because heaven is like the man who found a treasure and sells everything he has. I'm not going back. Sells everything he has. I don't want any distractions. Sells everything he has. I don't want any competition. Because I have found something that is worth the rest of my life. I want you to notice in this verse that he not only gets the treasure, he buys the field. And some of us need to understand this, and I hope, hope the kids will get it, because sometimes we as parents haven't been real good about buying into everything God has. We've been good about buying into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We've been really good at buying into this, Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my helper. Jesus is my comforter. Jesus is all I need. We got that. But you need to understand what Jesus was saying here was, it wasn't just the treasure. He bought the field. Jesus says to his disciples, look out into the field. The harvest is ready. I want you to consider the fact that the treasure is Jesus. I get that. The treasure is the kingdom of heaven on earth, which is Jesus. But the story doesn't just say he gets the treasure. That's, that's the next story. He gets the pearl of great price. Among all the pearls, he gets the treasure. He's got that. But in this particular story, he buys the field. In other words, everything that surrounds the treasure. In other words, if it belongs to God, it belongs to me. I want it all. I'm not just content to have this me and Jesus thing. I'm not just content to push everything in my life out and just have this little closet experience with Jesus. No, I'm buying the field. That's why the Bible talks about heaven as being streets of gold. That's why Jesus said, I go to prepare mansions. Because our challenge is to buy all that he has for us. To buy into everything he has for us. Can you imagine the person who stands before the Lord and says, I don't need streets of gold. You can take those back. Matter of fact, let's trade those in and feed all the kids in Africa or Nigeria or wherever. It's ridiculous, right? Can you imagine somebody going in and saying, Jesus, can we get rid of the angels? Let's just get rid of them. They're, they're always bowing. They're always like, holy, holy, holy. I mean, can't they just do something? That's just me and you, Jesus. That's just me and you. Can you imagine somebody going into heaven and, say, and the Lord says, do you like the mansions? And somebody says, well, since you asked... I, I, I think he could have used better architecture or, you know, the colored pattern. If you, just, if, you, if you just change the color a little bit, rather than pure white, let's have, let's have some variety. I know I'm being ridiculous, but let me tell you what happens before we get to heaven. We got people saying, it's a me and Jesus thing. I don't need church. We got people saying, it's a me and Jesus thing. I don't need to do that organized stuff. We got people saying, it's a me and Jesus thing, and I don't have to account to anybody else. I, I, nobody's going to judge me. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to do it 
what I want to do with me and Jesus. That's not what this parable says. This parable says the man found a treasure. And the treasure was worth everything he ever had, so he sold it. But in order to secure the treasure, he bought the field. Bought it all. Can you imagine somebody going to a car lot and saying, I really like the car, but you can keep the engine. Some of you can. Some of you guys, mechanically wise, you're like, yeah, I like that truck, but if it had this engine, you want to customize it, make it your own. That may work down on this level, and you can fool yourself to think that you can just buy into this me and Jesus relationship and let the other parts of the kingdom of God just kind of filter away. But I got a feeling that if you do that, you're going to stand before him one day and he's going to say, I don't know you. You're going to say, but Jesus, remember that day that I gave my life to you? And he'll probably say, you know, I remember that day. But what happened after that? You see, in Matthew 25, Jesus said there's going to come a day where he's going to separate folks on the left and the right. And some of the folks on the right, he's going to say, blessed are you, enter into my kingdom. Because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in jail, you came to me. When I needed something, you provided it. And they looked at Jesus and says, we never see you that way. Jesus says, as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, not sinners, my brethren, the body of Christ, the field. You get it? As you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Oh, but I don't want that fellowship stuff. I don't want that stuff. No, 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 no. It's a package, folks. Just like when we get to heaven, there will be angels. And they will be singing. And they will be bowing. And they will be declaring, holy, holy, holy. So if you can't like it down here, you're going to have a hard time in the gates of glory. That's the field. It's one of the reasons why we meet regularly is because we need the practice. We need all the practice we can get. Because we're practicing for eternity. Let us never underestimate that what God is doing now is preparing us not just for tomorrow or the next month or the next year. His ultimate goal is to spend eternity with you and you with him. The kingdom of heaven is understanding there's nothing else in comparison to it. And because it is that valuable, I will sell everything. And for the joy of being able to have that, it'll be worth the sacrifice. Listen, Hebrews 12 tells us this is exactly what Jesus did. When it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, Jesus gave it all. Jesus paid it all. Jesus left it there on the cross. When he said, into thy hands I commend my spirit, he was saying, I'll leave it all behind in order to have what is laying away for me. So today, consider this, please. There is nothing, nothing on this earth that will compare to eternal life. But until you can discover the joy of having the kingdom of God in you, you will wrestle with the stuff you have. 
and its ability to control you. And let me put it this way. Until you have sold everything you have and made that total commitment, until you've done that, you really don't understand what the kingdom of God is. I mean that. That's why it is a constant, constant prayer for the Christian. Let me grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the devil loves to throw stuff at us and get us going, squirrel, 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 squirrel exactly what he wants to do. Just to get our eyes off of the kingdom, off of the treasure, long enough to get us going a different direction. And until you fully understand the value of the kingdom of God, the things of this world will always be a temptation. There's an old song we used to sing that talked about Jesus being the Lord of all. A little short chorus has been going over and over in my mind all month long. It simply goes like this. Jesus be the Lord of all. You ever heard it? Jesus be the Lord of all. Jesus be the Lord of all. The kingdoms of my heart. That's where the battle is. That's where the battle is. It's in your heart. Jesus said where the heart is, that's where your treasure is. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a treasure. What are you treasuring? What has the ability to wrap you up? lead you away? What has the ability to turn your world upside down when Jesus has put you on your feet? Those are the kingdoms in our heart. Let me be very honest. Kids, please hear me. One of the things you as kids will wrestle with the rest of your life until Jesus comes is making sure that Jesus always sits on the throne of your heart. It is a struggle. Amen, adult? But it is possible. Amen? Those of you that weren't able to make it yesterday missed a great opportunity to be able to hear the impact of a life that put Jesus on the throne. Doesn't make the person perfect. But oh, the joy of going to heaven. For two years in a row, I've had a table up here. How many of you kids remember the pumpkin? Got a couple, yeah. And so I don't have the table, obviously, and we're not going to go through the pumpkin thing, but I want you to think about this. That what it means to truly give yourself to the Lord is displayed in this little story of a pumpkin. Because in order for the pumpkin to become something than what it is, just a pumpkin, just a gourd, Some things have to happen. Number one, it has to be taken out of the field and put into the hands of somebody who's going to change it. Just like we have to be taken out of our past, out of our present, and place our lives in the hand of Jesus who can change us. And one of the first things they do is they wash it up, right? Because when the... Pumpkin sits in the field, it's vulnerable to all the stuff. And the first thing Jesus does is he wants to wash us up, clean us up. 
But it's not enough to just have the dirt washed off the outside because while that's good, that's not the goal. So what does he do? person takes a knife and cuts a hole in the top. Ouch! I don't like that. You're invading my space. This hurts. And for the kids' sake, parents, do you know what it means to be cultured, carved by the Spirit? <laughs> yeah, I got a few. If you don't know, you may be a pumpkin still in the field. Because the Bible says God's Word is like a two-edged sword, and it, it cuts, it goes in, and it begins to carve. And He just doesn't carve it, though. He pulls it off, and all of a sudden, I'm naked. Oh, they can see everything inside of me. Ah! Have you ever had God show you what was in your heart and you didn't like it? Yeah. And then that hand, that same nail-scarred hand, begins to work into our lives just like the carver of the pumpkin starts to go in and grab what? You ever been inside a pumpkin? What's it feel like? Like slime. It is. It's wool. And you got seeds in there and you got all kinds of stuff in there. But Jesus goes past all the slime, all the feelings. (laughs) You ready for this? He really doesn't care how we feel. Ah, take that back. He cares how we feel, but he cares more about what we're going to become. That's really hard sometimes because sometimes we just want a feel-good God. We just want God to do what we want him to do so that we can feel good. But that doesn't make us better. Giving your kids what they want, when they want, every time they want, doesn't make them better. Parents getting what they want, when they want, and the time they want, doesn't make them good parents. Come on, kids, that was your line to say, amen. The hand of God begins to clean out begins to purify, begins to take that stuff in our lives, take it out. But the cutting's not done, is it? There's eyes, there's a nose, there's a mouth to be made. But once all the cutting's done, then it's possible to see the light inside of us. That candle inside of that pumpkin changes it from a marred pumpkin to something that sends a message. Go go look it up. Look at the images on the computer and, and you'll see that people have gotten real creative. And what I have loved as I've watched these people get creative with pumpkins is there can be some really, really artistic stuff done that is flat evil. And there can be some really, really artistic stuff done that is very, very complimentary and good. Guess what? You are God's treasure. He wants you to become what you can become in Christ. But you've got to let him own it. And once he owns us, his passion for us is to do the same thing and give everything we have, sell everything we have in order to have everything he has for us. That's the kingdom of heaven. It's not my words, it's what Jesus said. It's not my words, it's how Jesus lived. It's what he did. He laid down his life. And now he asks us to follow him. I realize today you may be at different places in your walk with God. And if you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, this is a really good day. This is a good day to say, God, 
I want you to live inside of me. And so here I am. I lay all my past. Say, you can have it all. Because I don't want to go back. I realize in this room, there's people who have been in church all their lives. And let me just say this. It is possible for that pumpkin that once used to shine brightly with a light to have the light put out. That's why it says fan the flame. It is possible for that pumpkin that once used to declare light into the darkness to become part of the darkness. Not losing the carving, not losing the clean outlook, but losing the effectiveness in the darkness. Where are you at today? 